what I do say is accept what's being said and what you've heard, but deal with your own shit. How were you treated from people from the outside, knowing that you are working with sex offenders and child killers? Um, I've been hated. I've been I've been uh, verbally attacked, and and I've had people crit- criticise me uh, for all sorts, but they've not understood. When it comes to family and friends and people that 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 have have known me for years. I think my, my sister might say that she'd always suspected I might end up in prison um, working with people um, because I think I've always been that way. And, and somebody in engineering, when I was leaving, most people were bemused by it. But one bloke said to me, and I can't remember his name, sadly, he said, you're anybody's dog. And he meant, I said, what do you mean by that? He said, you get on with everybody. So people that know me get on with the fact that I do the work I do or did. People that know me well get on with the fact that I can be supporting a sex offender in the community as well as supporting someone who's murdered, who's a gangster, who's an armed robber, who's a burglar, a drug dealer, whatever. I I can equally do that. The ignorant people in this world are the ones that centre in on Myra Hindley and think we've had some fantastic love affair or whatever, or that I'm out there to... um, fly the flag for child abusers which i'm not yeah so we'll touch on that that you mentioned that myra hindley who's one of the biggest involved yeah, yeah. one of the biggest child killings and was it five kids it was five children over a course of Her and, uh, is it brady he and brady, he and brady. Yeah. Moore, the moore's murder so how did that relationship come about then between you and myra um well because i i'd, I'd been awarded for my work with prisoners violent prisoners and their families it was nothing to do with sex offenders I'd had this award called the Butler Trust Award, where they give you a badge and you go up to Edinburgh and Holyrood Palace and shake hands with the great and good and and off you go. And part of that award was to, they said, what would you like to research? You can do a piece of research, what would you like to do? And I said, I'd like to research women in prison and as to why they don't get therapy and counselling. So, okay, fine. So the, the prison department paid me to go off and visit 12 female prisons. And chat to them, present the research, and look at whether there could be a grandum for women, which there's never totally been. There was something started at Winchester years back. Women don't get the same. And I ended up at Cook and Wood. So on the way down there, I knew that Myra Hindley was there. Um, Didn't think I'd get to meet her, because I already knew that she was kept separately. She was in the hospital unit. I I was going to ask the question, but didn't think I would and I went round the rest of the community met all the women had a chat had some lunch and then the governor said there's somebody who would like to see you up in the hospital uh, it's Myra and I said okay fine I'll, I'll come up there to sit and have a chat with her and we sat in the kitchen told her everything I'd told everybody else about where I was from about Grendon um, it was a it was a weird feeling because I, I I'm one of these that knew about the Moors murders, but I didn't know the ab- absolute details. But I knew it was bad enough. I know what I was, was the details? Meeting. Oh, where do you want me to start? It was the fact that they just basically she and Brady had taken innocent children, f- virtually for pleasure, killed them and buried them on the Moors. Um, and she's a woman. Bearing in mind, and I'd I'd you know I'd long since. Uh, been working with men and not with women offenders I don't know what sort of woman I was going to meet but what I'd got was what everybody else was that she's done her time and that's it she's probably going to stay there forever uh, but I was I was happy to meet her because I'd met other women that, that, that had uh, been involved in child, chill, uh, child killings as well uh, the other woman that was there is, who's dead now as well is Carol Hansen who was involved with her husband um, with child killings and Carol was there so Meeting Myra was no no different. I went and sat with her in the kitchen. Um, but the powerful, powerful thing about that, and it's appeared in, in the book I did, uh, which is called For the Love of Myra. I don't have a copy at the moment. But the kitchen was no bigger than about three foot by about six. So you're sat where you are now. I would have been sat closer so that our knees were touching. Yeah, that was quite powerful but that was the only place we could meet. So, and I did say at the time, I said, you know, we'll sat a bit close. You'll be on my knee, sh- knee before we know it. She said, oh, chance would be a fine thing. So she said, sense of humour was there. But we had a laugh and joke. <laughs> we talked about, we talked about Grendon. We talked about her journey. 
And she said, well, to me, it's just about to be decided, my journey. And I said, what do you mean? She said, I'm just about to find out whether I'm going to be in prison for the rest of my life or whether somebody is going to give me the chance for a bit of release. Um, what do you want? What do you want? I said, she said, what do you think? I'd like to be released. Whether I deserve it in the eyes of the public is different. Um, she never asked me whether I thought she deserved it at that point. Um, I don't think I'd have had an answer at that point because not not for me to judge. And that was it. So she said, interesting, interesting. I'd like to hear more. I said, well, I might be coming back. I don't know. The governor's got ideas for me to come and do a bit of work here. And that was it. Then I went back and I was in um, Grendon. I think it was about th two or three weeks later. And uh, the governor called me to his office and he said, there's someone on the phone who would like to speak to you. Um, a governor, Tim Newell. And it was the governor at Grendon, who they got, they know each other well, Chris Ellis, who said, um, it's not me that wants to speak to you, there's someone else. And they put Myra on. And Myra said, um, I, you know, I was really interested in meeting you. I was really interested in what you had to say and the way that you were presenting yourself. And I, I need help. I need some counselling and support. Um, would you be in agreement to come down and, and do that if it could be arranged? And uh, I sort of said, yeah, I'm, I'm happy enough to do that, but I don't quite know how it's going to work. And she said, well, I think the governors are going to talk about it with you anyway, but I just wanted you to say that, wanted to say that I was impressed by what I heard and I think you would be able to get me through this next difficult period. And I said, well, in that case, fine, I'll, I'll do what I can. And that was it. Conversation over. Then I was left with a dilemma because I couldn't carry on. Uh, I was working at Grendon as a uniformed officer. I couldn't be given time during my work time to travel 110, 150 miles down to Kent and 150, 110 miles back. Um, I had to do it on my time off, my weekends. And the governor had agreed that if I was going to do that it would have to be in my time off he would sanction it and get the home office to, home office to sanction me going down there he said i would welcome it joe um so everything I, was above board huh? everything was, above, everything board was then. above board so your what was your job then to get my, information my to understand who she was what yeah, she'd done i mean basically i didn't know what my job was going to be i mean she said to counsel me but actually it was more to do with providing emotional support psychological support um clearly there have been conversations and to this day i don't know what conversations about me between the governor in cook and wood and, and tim who doesn't live far away from here by the way uh who was the governor in grendon and i was never a party to anything that was said in between tim did say he would get he would have to seek permission from the home office so would i which was given chris had already agreed the governor in cookham she would accept me um, so yeah, it was all set up, but it was, it was. If you think about the things I've just said to you, and there was more to it than that. I was just a uniformed prison officer. I got no rank. I was co qualified as a, a counsellor at diploma level, and I got an online psychology degree, which wasn't worth shite. Um, but I was doing the work I thought fairly well with prisoners, so maybe that was my qualification. But I was a prison officer in uniform going down in civvies into a female establishment in Kent and working with female prisoners. So what was it like once you started working with her? It was it was fine because I took her the same way as I'd taken everywhere else, everybody else. We did agree. We agreed right from the off. I said, right, here's the deal. Here, here's the compact, if you like, to call it that. If you're going to talk to me, first of all, I'm going to want honesty. It goes without saying, if you're going to talk to me, it's no good if you're going to not be honest with me. If you're going to talk to me, it can't be confidential, right? And she questioned that. What, what do you mean? What, what, what do you mean it can't be confidential? In terms of, if you're talking to me, you're supported by another four or five people, I'll be part of that and I will share it with significant others in your life. That's the way I've worked with every prisoner I've come across that if they've got a mum or a dad or a brother or a sister who are interested in them and they're going to tell me one thing and them another and set up for failure, that's not going to happen. Did she have visitors? Yeah, yeah. She had a, um, a 
partner at the time, because she was in a lesbian relationship, her partner was visiting uh, regularly at that time, and she had um, visits from David Astor, who was the uh, uh, main supporter financially, and, of course, occasionally from Lord Longford, and from Peter Timms, who was ex-prison governor, Reverend Peter Timms. Was Tim. she ever still speaking to Ian Brady? No, she stopped speaking to Ian Brady way back, uh, and the last I don't even know when the last contact with him was. I can't remember now. But Brady wasn't on the scene at all. There was no communication with him whatsoever. Um, most of what she learned, she learned through the media. Uh, you know what was happening with him. So, point being, what I she told me was never going to be absolutely confidential. And I said, if you carry on and you work through your bits and you're honest about it and you find wherever you want to be, then that's fine. I can I can support all of that. And I did. So, But we only had somewhere in the region of 10 or 12 what could loosely be called counselling sessions. And I mean loosely because they were interrupted. Um, we were in the governor's office, so there was phone, phones going. There was noise outside. Twice we, we had a chat in the hospital unit. Um, but it was all done wherever we could meet. And then it, then what happened was the papers kicked off. They all went ballistic. Um, I were on the front page of The Sun? I was exposed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, as soon as that happened, I basically I thought, that's it, game over. Um, somebody, I was working with Myra in the prison, with the governors, with other key staff, with Myra's personal officer, producing reports for the parole board. And somebody, and to this day we don't know who it was, took took my report and sold it to the Sun newspaper. And in um, front of the Sun it says Myra Freedom Scandal. She's yeah, groomed for release. Yeah. So you were getting the blame for trying to help her to get her released. Clever headline, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's that, that paper page. sold out. I struggled to get a copy of that because when I, I went, because the governor called me and uh, Saturday morning it was quite early and said, Joe, are you sitting down? And I said, why should I be? And she said, um, the shit hit the fan was her words. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, you need to get a copy of the Sun newspaper. It's all gone pear-shaped. Um, somebody's given you a report. They've got it out there. Uh, you need to see the headline. Um, and I said, oh, OK. She said, just go off and have a read of the report and then give me a call later. Myra sends her regards, her love, um, and, and hopes that Wendy and Sophie are going to be OK um, through it, which was a nice touch. But uh, I went down to get the paper. I couldn't get one. I uh, went to the garage, went into town and struggled to get one. I don't even know where I got that copy from. So I, I went through a couple of hours of <laughs> what's been fucking written. And then I got it uh, and I read it and thought, what? You know, she's going nowhere. Uh, but that's what they pr produced. And, who and do you think sold the story? Who do I think? Yeah. I don't know. Could that have been her? No. She'd never have done that. No. Never. Could it have been a partner? No. The people that were close to her in a in a in a circle because she had a very tight inner circle. None of none of them would have done that. Um, but you don't, don't know because back in the day, you're talking what sixteen, seventeen years ago. This was. How, what's it, the yeah, day? Yeah. You're talking like fifty yeah. grand, a hundred grand for a front page story. I don't think anybody that knew David Astor would be short of fifty grand if they if they really wanted fifty grand. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I did get it, but anyway, I was paid, my salary was paid, but most of the people that supported Myra were not in there for money, the, the close circle. However, I don't know whether uh, orderly officer, the, you know, anybody in there that had keys to the, the gate officer. Did she ever talk anybody? about, like, the murders and stuff? Did she ever open up about everything that yeah, she had done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what was that I like, mean, first hearing of, that? Um... It, it was tough. It was tough because basically um, she'd not opened up at all much during her sentence as much as I was pushing her to open up. So it was tough for her because I wasn't going to leave any stone unturned. Um, she wanted me to challenge, so I was going to challenge certain things. But it was tough for me to hear as well because just by coincidence, and again it's it's mentioned in the book, I sort of hit the killing of Leslie and Downey coming up to the Christmas period when everybody's getting ready for Christmas festivities 
and everybody's getting excited about Christmas for their children. I'm sat talking to Meyer in the governor's office about Leslie's killing, about Leslie's murder. Um, and it was bloody difficult to sit there and to sit through that. Um, we did something in the beginning, as a, just as a by the by, where initially the first two sessions we talked with the light out. Why? Well, uh, she, she said, I, I want to speak, but I want to speak with the light out. And I said, why would you want to do that? She said, because at this moment in time, um, the fluorescent light hurts my eyes, but also I want to be able to talk without you reading what's happening on my face. And I said, why do you want to do that? Anyway, I said, okay, so we'll do it. It was getting dusk, so we, we spoke in the darkness, but not complete darkness, you know. And uh, I said to her afterwards, it was a couple of months after, I said, what, what was all that about? Why, why would we really have to do, go through that fast just for a couple of interviews? And she said, I just, it's something I wanted to do. Um, I didn't want to see your reaction. I said, what sort of reaction were you expecting you were going to see? Shock, horror, disgust, whatever, whatever you want, whatever you want to look at it. Did she have an attraction for you? I said, do you, no. Well, attraction in terms of... Did she like you? She liked me yeah. as a friend. She called me a rock in one letter, and she was always pleased to see me. Um, but she um, she said that in those first two sessions, and we hadn't got into anything heavy, she said, but I was going to mention the fact that I'd, 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 you know, I was parted to killing these children and what I'd done, certainly with, with um, Keith Bennett. Um in a part in that and, and the most important one to her was Pauline Reed was the first one because she told everybody that Brady had basically instigated the lot and that he was the one who'd chosen her for the killing when it wasn't it was her but what she'd done it for was mainly because she wanted to just speak and then my reaction was judged by the way I'd reacted subsequently and I said what do you see in my eyes now you know what do you really expect she said, what, what, what have you seen since You've told me this. And now we've gone through Leslie Ann Downey's, kill it, kill, Leslie Ann Downey's killing. Which, by the way, when I finished, I'd then got to get in my car and drive all the way back home. Uh, and that was sometimes very difficult. At Grendon, I had therapy meetings followed by staff feedback uh, and s an element of supervision. With Myra, I had what she'd given me, driving, thinking about it, and then I'd wait until I got back to work maybe three or four days later because, before I could speak to Dr. Jack Wright, who was a psychiatrist at Grendon, and offload. Mm -hmm. So I carried it. And I do remember that, that night of when we went through Leslie Ann's um, murder, driving back, and it was cold, it was winter, um, and driving back up the motorway, I was looking into the distance, my mind was on the moors. Uh, it was awful. I was thinking of kids getting ready and families getting ready and, and not having your child on a Christmas day. How long did their killing spree last over? It went over a period of four years. So for, well, six, finished in 66, so it started in 62, 63, I think. And that was five killings from so, ages of 17 to like six years old, yeah. or eight years old. And there, there was like gaps that. before them, you see, gaps been between Could each. Could there have been so. more? Could there have been more? Yeah. I think... I think they could. I mean, because it was it ended the way it did. I mean, it ended because Brady effectively lost the plot. He he stopped being careful, and the Edward Ed, Edward Evans killing was a mess, an absolute mess. What happened? Well, he got Edward Evans to uh, come back to the house. He'd met him out in Manchester. There was rumours that around that Edward had been, you know, was gay, and they'd been, and that Brady had been frequenting the gay places. Um, and that, that he himself was gay. Um, but effectively, they, he'd brought Edward Evans back to the house, ostensibly for a, a game of cards, and then bludgeoned him with a, an axe. But before he did it, he'd actually got Myra's brother-in-law, David Smith, to come over um, and witness what he was doing. Uh, Myra's part in all of this, because she said she wasn't around at the time, she was in the kitchen and stuff like that. Um, how true is that though that how she, true yeah was it true or is she also a liar she, she stuck she stuck 
to me with the fact that she, no, she was nothing at all to do with that. She knew what was going on. She could, Christ, it was, she could have heard it, you know. And when she did, she admitted to hearing what was going on. Mm. But as far as they were concerned, and then entering at a point when it was, it was too late. Um, and da but David Smith was traumatised by it. I mean, you can imagine, can't you? So the, what I'm saying is where it went wrong was Brady did what he did thinking somehow along the line Smith was going to go along with it, who actually went back and told Myra's sister, who then phoned the police. And so next day he was arrested. So so this the cl cleverly controlled murders that they had in the past with the burying of the bodies, making sure they've checked they're all still wearing the same stuff and there was no evidence left around, cleaning the van, all of that had gone. It was getting Edward's body out of that house, you know, as best they could, wrapping him up, and putting him out of the way. Did you ever ask her, was. Was, was there more? Because if Yeah, no, I did. I said, you know, during the course of it, I said, were you involved in any more? And um, no. She said, I wasn't involved in any more. Could Brady have been involved in any more? Did you Maybe. ever speak to him? Sorry? Did you ever speak no, to Brady? No, I tried. I, I wrote to him on two or three occasions. Um, first occasion was just a hi, I'm Joe Chapman, you probably know I'm counselling Myra, it would be great to have a chat with you. Uh, I left it, nothing, don't even know whether it got to him. The second one, I had a little bit more information, so I'd written to him saying, listen, uh, Myra's told me what's what's been, uh, what, what her part in it, it's, it's, it's unravelling, I'd like to get your side on it. I'm starting to see some of the things that you've alluded to. Uh, I'd like to chat to you about that. And here, by the way, is a, a, a letter in Myra, Myra's handwriting that she'd given me to give me authority to sort of speak to you, but she doesn't want to speak to you. Did she ever break down crying or anything, or was it just all no Yeah, and the Leslie, Ann, the Leslie Ann Downey one she did, um, because that was, that was t more to do with the fact that I think she'd started, over the years, she'd started to home into the person she used to be. And she used to be, without doubt, when you listen to people that knew her as a child, she was good with children. She was trusted. I mean, she used all of that eventually to, 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 uh, to do what she did, but she was good with kids. Um, and as, as time went by and she was introduced to staff and she was, when I first um, went to Cookham, and this is important to mention this, is there was a life as evening going on and Myra had a baby in her arms, a, a young baby, which I thought initially was a bit odd, but it didn't strike me as odd the fact that she was holding the baby so much as the fact the baby was there um, because the, the prison rules were and no kids under the age of 18. Having said all of that, with me, I'd been given permission all the way through my career to bring my kids into prison at various ages. So I was in this bit of like, well, that's she's having a photo taken as well. That's a bit risky, really. I, nothing happened to that photo, by the way. Apparently, it didn't develop, and I believe it because it's never come, never materialised. Why would why is that allowed though? From the biggest child killers and right uk why is childs allowed in well they shouldn't have been them? basically but they were and and the point where it went wrong for me as well was that my this is going back to grendon again i'm i, I know we're on the myra thing but it's sort of interlinked oh, yeah yeah is that grendon traditionally right from the start in the 60s through to um well even now they have socials but grendon used to have wing socials and they used to have charity um concerts at christmas where staff and their children could come to the charity carol concerts. They could come and watch the pantomimes. And staff and their children, which included my children, could come to the Christmas parties, which I ran for, oh, I think I ran eight years, Christmas parties at Grendon. So for me, children coming into a prison to be with amongst child sex offenders and killers and stuff like that, has been something that's all was always second nature, and to you it's sounding like so yeah yeah I don't Jesus think yeah Christ, I don't think that's you? right. That's right. like a, giving a killer a, a gun or a, a rapist, putting him in a fucking a right. room full I of girls. I tell you what was I'm now able to say was that I don't think the process I followed through that period 
was any different to anybody else's. But I think because of what happened with me and my daughter, they were right to stop it. Not because my daughter was at any risk, but because that loophole, that that little uh, bit of what was happening, natural for prisons, had to stop. So... In a way, did I ever feel I'd done wrong by my kids and by my daughter? The answer's no. And if Sophie was here now, she would say the same. That's not the point. People from outside didn't like what had happened. People from outside didn't understand it. My daughter was eight when she was taken into Cook and Wood because she wanted to know where Dad was working on a Sunday. And I said to the governor, you've got this lifers day happening. Are children allowed in? And... She said, well, yeah, I suppose so, but a lot of the staff are not bringing their kids. They're bringing, they used to bring their dogs and horses and stuff in. And I said, well, can Sophie pop down and uh, join in with what's going on? Yeah, she said, of course you can. So that wasn't a problem. So Sophie travelled with me on her own to Cookham, and she went into the lifer unit that's down there, and she was taken under a wing by the women in the lifer unit, all of whom I knew. I'd known them all for nearly a year. Um... And she enjoyed cooking. She went to the she, she went to the hairdressing salon first, and and just did had her nails done and what have you. And then they took her and she did a bit of cooking. She went and helped out in visits, serving. But in the afternoon, she came up into the admin block where because I'd been to see Myra, and Chris said Myra's got this cardboard globe that she wants to make with Sophie. Is that okay? They can sit and make it while we have a chat. I said yeah, of course you can. So. She sat with my daughter in the governor's office, the side deputy governor's office, making this cardboard globe. Um, and then there was a knock on the door, and uh, I think it was a principal officer or somebody there said, Myra's off on her way out, and uh, she's wondering if Sophie can go down to the gym. She's going down to use the gym, the trampoline. Uh, and that, we'll have a look through uh, around the grounds on the way through. In actual fact... Myra wasn't going with the principal officer. She was going with Nina Wilde, who was her... Um, I didn't know that at that, at that time, but, but who later became her lover. Right. So Nina, who was a criminology student working in Cookham, who had keys, went with Myra and my daughter to play on the trampoline, to go walks in the grounds, to look in the pond at the frogs and tadpoles, and then came back up. Right. Because you've worked with her... It's still pe people looking at it outside they'll be going fuck me what, man what's happening yeah but you know you can you understand know, that do you know what I mean so it, what is the benefits so, though for that what is the benefits for who there's no benefits uh -huh. other than I didn't say okay look if anything I was condemned by David Astor for doing that for producing the worst negative publicity ever did that her. come out in the press that yeah it, it, years later though this is the clever bit this is what sometimes the media do and I hope you never get into that ball game. Is they wait for a period of time and then they make it current. When Sophie went in to meet Myra, she was eight. When it hit the press, she was 13. Okay, she's still a child, but it was five years before. They then brought it out as if I'd done it currently, you know. So everybody's going, What's he doing? It doesn't matter. There's eight and 13. What's the difference, really? There is a bit of difference, but not to make a great deal. But what they did was they immediately went on the attack, attack, attack. I was uh, heralded as the worst um, father in Britain. Um, and basically the mirror went for it. And who could be stupid enough to do this? And it was me. But I, I still, I accepted what I'd done. And I said why I'd done it. And the people that knew me, and we're not just talking professionals, we're talking prisoners that had known me for years, who weren't sex offenders, who were gangsters, who were people who might have also been um, shocked by it. They're not shocked by it. Because my kids came into Grandin, my son, my older boy, when he was, I believe, 15 or 16, and he was going down the wrong track, came in and sat with a couple of lifers in Grandin. You see, know? I don't see that as much of a problem because right. somebody who's maybe done a big robbery, done a murder, but maybe changed their life. And Because I know guys who do go around schools and prisons and talk about the younger things that they've done, Shit. don't go the same route. But for a child killer right. to sit with a kid, it's, it's a totally different ball game.